In this video, we're going to walk through an Excel simulation spreadsheet that I created, and it kind of ties in with this week's Substack newsletter. So I want to start by addressing some of the features that I mentioned. And the first is cell references. So if I go here to cell C21, you'll see there's a formula up here, dollar sign C dollar sign eight times one plus random return savings B7 plus dollar sign B21. So let me talk briefly about the cell references here. I start with an absolute cell reference. The dollar sign in front of the C, the dollar sign in front of the 8, tells Excel always go to C8 in order to grab that initial $30,000. No matter where I drag that formula, it's always going to start by going to get that $30,000 that's in cell C8. And then I multiply by one plus random return savings. That just identifies the sheet. I'm going to a different worksheet. But I want cell B7 from that worksheet. Notice there's no dollar sign in front of the B. There's no dollar sign in front of the 7. So these are relative cell references. They're saying when I drag that down, I want it to go to B8, B9, B10. When I drag that across, I want it to go to C7, D7, E7. I want it to automatically update both the column and the row as I drag that across. Now I'm going to go to the random return saving sheet real quick. And you can see that's just a return that I've generated. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But each month has a different return and each trial has a different return return. So I want to make sure I grab that month's simulated trial. So I've got an absolute cell reference, a relative cell reference, and now here I've got a mix. The B is an absolute cell reference. I always want it to go to column B, but I want the row to be a relative cell reference. And that's because as I drag this formula across, I always want it to go to column B. But as I drag it down, I want it to update the row. So instead of going to B21, here I want it to go to B22. Here I want it to go to B23. I want it to adjust the row. And that's because every year I'm going to increase my savings by a certain amount. And so my contribution for that month is going to be different from month to month. Every year it's going to increase by 3%. So I've used an absolute cell reference, a relative cell reference, and a mixed cell reference. Now the next thing I want to talk about is freezing panes. So if you notice, one of the things that I mentioned in the newsletter is that we want to make the spreadsheet usable. So if I'm a financial advisor and I want to show this to a client, I don't want to have to dig all over for things. I want it to be right up front. But I've got a whole bunch of rows. If you scroll down, you can see it keeps going and going. And as I scroll over, you can see it keeps going and going. So I've got a lot of rows and a lot of columns. And if I don't have my panes frozen, I'm going to lose track of where I am. So let me go up here to View, Freeze Panes, and just for a second, I'm going to unfreeze those panes. Now, as I scroll down, all that stuff disappears from the top. As I scroll over, all that stuff disappears. And if I scroll over and down, now I don't know what trial I am, what month I'm in, things like that. So by freezing panes, and I'm going to set my cell here. I'm going to freeze everything above and everything to the left of that cursor. So I'm going to go to freeze panes, click on that. And now when I scroll down, you can see I keep those headings that I want. So that's going to be a huge advantage for me as I'm moving through the spreadsheet. Next, I want to talk a little bit about random returns. 
The idea is that often when you're learning finance, you might use a five key calculator or a time value of money table in order to learn time value of money. However, in reality, you don't see 8% returns year after year after year. Instead, what you see is one day stocks are up, the next day stocks are down, and you might average an 8% return or a 9% return or something like that over the course of 20 or 30 years, but you're not gonna get 8% every year consistently. Instead, you're gonna get random fluctuations. Now, in reality, it's gonna fluctuate on a daily basis, but to simplify things, I just said, let's have monthly returns. So this is month one, trial one, and I wanted to set up a random return. Now, as I mentioned in the newsletter, returns do not follow a standard normal distribution. Instead, they tend to be a log normal distribution. And that's because as we see returns go down, your worst case scenario is you lose 100%. You can't lose more than 100% on an investment, assuming you don't have margin, but you can make more than 100%. Um, I mentioned Tesla in the Substack newsletter, if you've read that, and Tesla over the last approximately year and a half or so has gone up about 1,500%. So you have a right tail distribution that allows you to have far more than 100% returns. Now, they're going to be rare, but you're going to get some of those huge upsides and you're not going to lose more than 100%. So it tends to follow a more log normal distribution. Now what I've done is set this formula up and I've used cell references so I can change if I want to change the expected return or the standard deviation and that will update throughout all these formulas. And another thing that I did is said, well, we tend to get more risk averse over time. So we're going to have a higher risk portfolio for the first 25 years and then we're going to lower that risk some um, later on. So what I did is I actually went and pulled up some historical data and this is the S&P 500, um, a bond composite, and what I did is use ETFs, exchange traded funds, to get some historical numbers. Now they're not perfect because this only goes back to 1993 for the S&P and it only goes back to like 2003 for the bond ETF, but it gives me at least some historical basis. And if I look at a heavily stock weighted portfolio, my average monthly return is 0.88% a month and my average standard deviation is 3.75%. So that gives me kind of a ballpark. And then later on, I said, hey, let me move to a 60-40 portfolio, a little more conservative. And again, these are approximations. If you're more conservative, you can downscale this. You can say, hey, maybe we have earned almost 0.9% a month, but I think 0.75 might be more realistic going forward. So you can change those as you want. So the formula here says go up and grab this random number and or this number and this number for our baseline expected return and standard deviation of the distribution and so this is the formula that you would use to generate a random monthly return with an expected return of 0.85 percent standard deviation of 3.8 percent and a log normal distribution now the reason we do this is because, as I mentioned, returns are not consistent. Sometimes you're gonna have higher returns, sometimes you're gonna have lower returns, and what's going to matter is not only the average return you earn, but how those returns are sequenced. If you have high returns early on and low returns later on, that's gonna have a bigger impact because early on you don't have as much money to benefit from the high returns, but later on you're gonna have a lot of money that's gonna get hit hard by the negative or lower returns. On the other hand, if you have negative returns early on, you're not gonna lose much because you don't have much capital. And if you get high returns over the last couple of years, that can really have a big impact 
on your portfolio. So both the nature of the returns, and here you can see average actual return 0.47% and 1.19%. That's going to have a huge difference on how much money we have with the same contributions that we make. And so that's trial one and trial five. Let's go back and take a quick look and see trial one. Here we have just under $600,000. Trial five, we have over $7 million. So huge impact. What's that mean for our retirement income? It means here we're going to have about $2,700 a month. Here we're going to have almost $39,000 a month. Huge difference, just a different scenario. Now, neither one of these is likely to occur. As a matter of fact, this is our minimum wealth out of all 100 trials that we did. This is not quite our maximum, but you can see it's pretty close to it. And on average, we have 2.38. If we take a median, so half the time or higher, half the time or lower, it's 1.8. So this is a really good outcome. And this is a really bad outcome in our Monte Carlo simulation. Now, the benefit of a Monte Carlo simulation is it gives you a lot more information. The downside of a Monte Carlo simulation is it gives you a lot more information. It's harder to interpret. Because if you look here now in 100 trials, here's the different outcomes. And I'm going to show you something else real quick. In this spreadsheet that I use for my class, I had them do a Monte Carlo simulation with 100 outcomes. But in reality, you might want to look at more than 100. You can do that by just dragging these across to create more columns if you want. Or you can go to Data. And let's see if I can find it real quick. And somewhere there's formulas right here. And if I hit calculate now, you can see it just updated. So trial one before was a little under 600,000. Now it's 2.5 million. Trial five was up almost 8 million. Now it's at 2.4 million. Huge difference. My minimum now is 429, so I'm a little worse off. My maximum, 10 million. So I just generated another quick 100 trials. Do it again. Now my minimum is almost 800,000. I have no times where I end up with less than 750,000. And you can just keep re-clicking and generate another 100 trials real quick to kind of see the potential outcomes that could happen. How many outcomes should you look at? There's not really a set answer. I would argue 100 is probably on the low side, but you're probably not getting that much additional benefit from more than 1,000. Now, one of the things that I have my students do, because I think it's worthwhile, is generate a graph to kind of break that down. So here you can see the graph. One of the things, again, you want to try to do when you create a spreadsheet is make sure that it's easy to interpret. So you should have a description of what that graph is telling you, how much wealth you're going to have at retirement, and a simple breakdown of what these charts mean. So 4% of the time, you have less than 750,000. 27% of the time, you have between 1.75 and 2.5 million in your retirement account. Now, one last thing I want to look at is sometimes we'll play the question of how much is enough. And it's really an unknowable question because you don't know how long you're going to live. You don't know what's going to happen to your returns. So you can't know the answer of how much you need at retirement. You can only approximate and get a feel for what you might need. So I also had students set up a spreadsheet where they had $1.3 million at retirement. And then they were going to withdraw $6,886. And essentially... That's how much was going to allow them to be left with 300000 using a five-key time value of money approach. So if they earned exactly 4.78% over 25 years, they could take out $6,886 
and at the end of that 25 years still have 300,000 left over. But as you can see, that's not how it works. In trial one, they had almost a million dollars at the end of their 25 years. In trial five, they ran out of money after 142 months. They didn't even make it halfway through their 25 year retirement window and they were out of money. Over here in trial 10, they ended up with 1.3 or 1 million more than they had when they retired. So they actually grew their wealth during retirement. And what you'll see is if you run a simulation, you're gonna run out of money here about 40% of the time, because we have 100 trials. Almost 50% of the time, you're gonna end up with more than 300,000. On average, you're gonna last 273 months. Now remember, it's capped at 300. Obviously over here, this trial is gonna last a lot more than 300 months, but that gives you kind of a ballpark. Here is your lowest, and that happened to be trial five, where you lasted 142, but jump over here to trial nine, you lasted 196. Over here, trial 14, you lasted 163. So quite a few times you don't make it through the 25 year window and the maximum value at retirement is almost $6.7 million. So this allows you to play around, do a little what if analysis. And it's also a great way to learn a little bit about Excel. Now, one thing I should note is in the Substack newsletter, this spreadsheet is available to download. So all you have to do is download it. You have access to that spreadsheet and you can play around with it. You can use it to kind of figure out what I'm doing. Feel free to comment or send questions if you have them. Thank you.